This morning, we continue on the theme, manifestation of God's promise. And when I spoke last, I promised that we would do a second part on hindrances to God's promises. But I've given it another topic this morning, even though I'm going to deliver what I promised. And the topic is receiving God's promises. Receiving God's promises. And by the grace of God this morning, we're going to further talk about some hindrances, and then we're going to talk about how to receive God's promises. <clears throat> Please turn your Bibles with me to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. We will read a few verses, and then we will read the first four verses of Numbers chapter 14. <clears throat> Numbers 13, 26 to 33. Numbers 13, 26 to 33. Now they departed and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land has, are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountain. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the bank of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone as spies. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so were we in their sight. Numbers 14, verse 1 to 4. So the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. May Lord, the Lord bless, bless his word this morning in our hearts in Jesus' name. The account I have just read speaks about the children of Israel at the border of the promised land. At the border of the promised land, according to God's instruction, Moses sent Try, I mean, spies from the 12 tribes of Israel to go and spy out the land. There was no question about the promise because God never lies. He is the owner and the possessor of heaven and earth. He gives to who he wants. Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He gives it to whosoever he wants. There was no question about the promise. It was now time to possess. In receiving and possessing God's promise, it is not always an instant thing. And it's not always a walk in the park. When God gives you an inheritance, a lot of times it is occupied and there needs to be a displacement. 
but God will always fulfill his promise. There may be what seems like human delay in human, I mean, like delay in human timings. There may sometimes be a battle. We must guard our thoughts because the thoughts, the mind is the battlefield of the enemy. We must guard our minds. We must guard our thoughts. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, because, uh, we should guard it because out of it springs the issues of life. And as we know, scripture also says, as a man thinks, so he is. We must hold on to God's promises, come what may. This morning, I want us to explore this aspect as we speak about the five Ds that can hinder us from receiving God's promises out of the battlefield of the mind, out of the enemy's battle to throw us off. I pray that today, the Lord will grant unto you and I the inner strength that we need to hold on, to receive God's promises in Jesus' name. Amen. God's promises are yea and amen. There's no doubt about that. What is the first D that I'm going to be talking about this morning that could hinder a man from receiving God's promises? It is delay. A lot of times, the manifestation of God's promises are delayed according to God's timing, according to man's timing. But in God's timing, it is the right time. It is not delayed. Even the scripture recognizes that when there is delay, it can make you sick. As it is written in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. It makes the heart sick. So even the scripture recognizes that hope deferred can cause you to faint, can cause the heart to faint, can cause you to lose hope. When you are being expecting an answer to a prayer, an intervention, a visitation, whatever it is that you have expecting, and it seems delayed, it becomes a battle to stay focused on any other thing. It becomes a battle to stay focused on God's promises. Other things may begin to come in, like disbelief, like doubts. For a fact, God's promises may be delayed at times. But until we turn into the Bible and discover that it's normal for him to walk slowly according to human standards, because his time differs and you will begin to disbelieve his promises. Consider Abraham. God promised him land, plentiful descendants, and those and that those descendants will bless all the nations in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Yet Abraham died with only a handful of descendants. Hundreds of years later, his family was enslaved in Egypt, still without land. And it took nearly 2,000 years for all the nations to be blessed through the greatest descendant, Jesus Christ. God did everything he promised, but not nearly as fast as Abraham would have liked it to be. The Lord promised Caleb, Caleb land, as a reward of his faith, inspiring out the promised land and bringing a good report. But if you look at scriptures, it took 45 years before it could settle down on that terrain. Check Joshua chapter 14, verse 6 to 15. Perhaps most notable is God told Eve that one of her descendants would destroy the serpent, would bruise the head of serpent. It took millennia for this promise to be fulfilled through Christ's death and resurrection. What he brings delay, when he brings delay, it may be to try your faith. It may be to build you up. It may be to build your patience. My encouragement for you this morning, child of God, is to wait for the Lord. Isaiah 30 verse 18 makes us to understand that the Lord waits to be gracious to us that the Lord will be exalted to have mercy on us, that the Lord is a God of God's justice and blessed are those who wait for him. 
I'm encouraging you this morning, wait for him. Wait for his promises to be fulfilled. He will not fail. The time of delay is a time for you to prove your relationship with God. That your relationship is not about what you get, but it's a sincere relationship with his person. Remember that Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 2 verse 3, he says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the end of it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, though it tarries, though it tarries, that is though it is delayed, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. A lot of Christians today are discouraged. A lot of Christians today are fainting because the Lord has delayed his coming. But why has he delayed his coming? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is waiting so that all will come to repentance. I say to you this morning, my brother, my sister, under the sound of my voice, whether you are in the service or you are watching online, wait for him. Wait faithfully for him. Keep on believing. Delay is not denial. He will come through for you in the name of Jesus. What is the second D that I want to talk about this morning? It is doubt. Doubt is another hindrance. Doubting will make you lose sight of God's promises, thereby not seeing the manifestation of it. In the text that we read this morning, Numbers chapter 13, verse 31, the spies doubted the promise of God. They said, but the men who had gone up, the scripture said, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Hello, are these the same people that God parted the Red Sea for? Are these the same people that God drowned Pharaoh and his chariots for? Are these the same people that God fed with angelic food in the wilderness? Are these the same people that the Bible says even their clothes did not fade in wilderness? Are these the same people they did not have any downtime because somebody was sick in the wilderness. Are these the same people that God promised, I will take you to the promised land? Now, what are they saying? They are doubting that promise by saying we are not able to go into the land that we have been promised. When you doubt, all you see is impossibility. All that these spies saw was impossibility. We are not able to. Who told you? My brother, my sister, you are able because the God that you serve and the God who has promised you is able. It is not going to be by power. It's not going to be by strength. It's going to be by his spirit. Yes, you are able. There's no need to doubt. God said he will give them a land. Now they are saying we are not able. When you doubt, you lose sight of, your, of God's ability and you begin to see your own ability. When you doubt, all you see is impossibilities because your ability will not cut it. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 30 to verse 31, Peter gives us a picture of doubt and what doubts can do. Peter saw Jesus walking on water and he said, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. And he stepped into water. The Bible records that Peter actually walked on water. But then he suddenly began to look at other evidences around instead of the promises of God. He began to listen to evidences. He began to see evidences. He began to hear physical ev evidences. Sometimes evidences are contrary to God's promise and contrary to God's word. Immediately he took his face up, off. Jesus, immediately he stopped looking at him and he saw this boisterous storm. What happened? The Bible says he began to sing. And Jesus said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter doubted. And that is the reason why he sang. When we doubt, then we lose track and lose our focus on God's promises. Doubt is not a complete absence of faith, 
is faith laden with weights of unbelief. That's doubt. Do you struggle with doubt? Of course you do. Everybody does. Are you wondering, what will it be like at the end? Will I get it? Will I make it? Will it manifest? This morning I encourage you to surrender to the Spirit of God because the work of the Spirit in this hour and in the hour of your trial, the hour of your need is to preserve you from faith destroying doubt and to give you the sweet gift of God's assurance. Surrender your thoughts to the Holy Spirit this morning. Because the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 6 to verse 8, it says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Verse 7 says, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Meaning, if you doubt, you will not receive the promise. Abraham did not have a full revelation of the Bible. He knew the promise of God. He, as regards the Messiah, he never knew the Messiah. We know the Messiah. But in spite of our advantages over Abraham, we still doubt. This morning, take your heart to the Holy Spirit. Let him help you. Take your heart to the Holy Spirit. Let him strengthen you. Let him preserve you from faith-destroying doubt and give you assurance that comes from the presence of God. The problem with all these deeds, starting with delay, going to doubt, is that one leads to the other. Delay leads to doubt. And brethren, doubt leads to disappointment, which is my third D this morning. Doubt leads to disappointment. Because if you doubt, and the Bible says in James 1, 7, that you will not receive anything, there will be disappointments. On the other hand as well, disappointments in circumstances of your life will make you to lose focus of the promise of God. Have you prayed and believed God for something? For something to happen in the month of June? And here we are in August. It has not yet, yet happened. You are still waiting. Have you prayed for a healing? Your hopes were high, yet it has not happened. Have you prayed for God to vindicate you? And it's as if the problem is escalating and deepening. The spies in our text today felt disappointment. They saw what God said they could have. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. But they felt disappointment because they thought, even though it is flowing with milk and honey, we can't have it. And they said in verse 27 and 28 of Numbers, the 13th chapter, they said, we went to the land that you sent us. Truly, truly. It flows with milk, milk and honey. As a matter of fact, we brought fruits. Look at the fruits. Nevertheless, that is, but. We saw the milk and honey, but. The people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. We saw the giants. It's such a disappointment. We can't have it. Um, they saw insurmountable obstacles that will prevent them from receiving the promise. The challenge is that once a man enters this particular gear, they close their mind. These spies closed their mind. They felt disappointed that even though we can see it, our hands cannot touch it. Even though we can see it, there's nothing we can do about it. What a disappoint, disappointing voice that they gave to the situation. It is the same reason why some people 
are not responding to altar call for healing or for blessings or for whatever reason the altar call is being made anymore. Why? Because they think they have been disappointed before. They went out for that altar call for healing. They came back and there was no healing. Healing has not manifested. Someone once told me, I've gone out severally and nothing happened. I have now got to protect myself from disappointment. It is too painful. Can you see? Such a person has closed their minds and will not, will no longer look forward to the promises of God or possess their possession concerning that matter. God will help us in Jesus' name. Proverbs 13, verse 12 that I read before, now I will read it in the message translation. It says, unrelenting disappointment leaves your heart sick. When there is disappointment upon disappointment, when there's disappointment, continuous disappointment, it leaves your heart sick. I pray for healing this morning for every heart and every mind who has suffered disappointment, who is still suffering disappointment and is finding it difficult to focus on the promise of God. Today, I pray for mercy. Today, I pray for healing. Today, I pray that the promises of God concerning you will manifest in the name of Jesus. Lord, heal your people this morning. Heal these people this morning who have suffered disappointment and, not, and are not able to find inner strength to continue. Lord, heal them in the name of the Lord Jesus. What do you do when you're disappointed? What is your response to disappointment? Is it to give up? Or is it to remember God's promises? To remember the person who gave the promise? To remember that the integrity of that promise depends on the person, the personality of the person that gave it. David said, I mean, Job said in Job 13, verse 15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, and I will maintain my own ways before him. Will you maintain your own ways before him? Will you hold on his promises no matter what you are going through? Or will you give up? God's plan will always be more beautiful and greater than every of our disappointments. Disappointments sometimes can be God's appointment. And disappointment is not a good thing. You want to cast out disappointment this morning because disappointment leads to discouragement and the cycle goes on. Now, the 4D that I'm sharing this morning is discouragement. Discouragement by definition is a deficit in courage. Biblical courage is the ability to face uncertainty, adversity, danger, or suffering with faithful hope that God will keep his word to us, come what may. In the face of uncertainty, in the face of adversity, in the face of danger, in the face of suffering, having faithful hope that God will keep his word is courage and discouragement is a deficit of that. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20, that is our, uh, the, the, our theme scripture for this month, says that his promises are yes and amen. They are a done deal. There's no question about it. Even though you may have experienced delay, even though you may already be doubting, even though there are disappointments, even though maybe right now it has led to discouragement, God will fulfill his promise. And our text this morning, in Numbers 13, verse 31 to 33, the children of Israel decided to walk by sight. Remember, as we said the last time, that one of the things that will help you to receive your promises is faith and not sight. If you walk by sight, you will lose heart. You have to walk in faith. The children of Israel decided to walk by sight because they walked, they walked by sight, they lost sight of God's promises to give them the land. And so what did they say in verse 31? They said, we are not able to go against these people for they are stronger than we. 
they are stronger than we. They walked by sight. Then they saw, they saw the men of great stature. They saw the giants, the descendants of Anak. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. And they thought that even the descendants of Anak saw them as grasshoppers. They lost sight of the promise. And what did they see? They saw the problem. They saw the mountains. They saw the issues. They saw the obstacles. And they considered them insurmountable. And they backed out. When you fill your sight with the problem, when you fill your sight with the need, you will lose sight of God's promises because you will be discouraged by what you are saying. We shall not walk by sight, but we will walk by faith. The result of them walking by sight is what we see in Numbers chapter 14, verse 1 to verse 14. The Bible says that they cried all night and they decided we are not holding on to God's promises again. We are not going forward. We are not going into the promised land. We are not going to receive the promise that God gave to us. God should have left us the way we are today, to before. We prefer the slavery to freedom. We prefer the oppression to a land filled with milk and honey. They became discouraged. They lost motivation. To, 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 to go forward. They lost their drive to advance. They had cold feet. Their thinking pattern changed. They saw themselves as grasshopper. And instead of them to remember that they're victorious people, that the Lord had battled Pharaoh on their behalf and they had been victorious. Their thinking pattern changed. They went into self-pity. They went into a feeling of not good enough. They went into self-rejection. They went into a feeling of inability. They went into a feeling of inferiority complex. They went into a feeling of blaming themselves. The Bible says that they said to Aaron and, and, and to Moses, you should have left us where we were. We did ask you to come and help us. So, discouragement. My brother, my sister, where are you in this journey? Are you discouraged? Do you find that you are losing motivation? You are losing your drive. You are having cold feet. Your thinking pattern is changing. Now you are going into self-pity. Now you are seeing yourself not good enough. Self-rejection. Now you have a feeling of inability and inadequacy. Now there is inferiority complex. And you have now begun to point fingers. You are blaming yourself, you are blaming others. When people enter this gear, they enter the realm of the flesh. They lose sight of God's promises. And when, whenever you lose sight of God's promises, you cannot receive it. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6b says, But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. It is important that you and I remain courageous. It's important that you and I will encourage ourselves in the Lord and wait for the manifestation of his promises, knowing that he never fails, knowing that he never lies, knowing that he's the owner of all things, knowing that he is the owner, the possessor of heaven and earth, knowing that he is rich and can afford it, knowing also that he's generous, and then above all, knowing that he loves you and he will not withhold any good thing from you. Encourage yourself. Whenever you find yourself in that place and the enemy is speaking negatives to you, and the enemy is telling you it's not going to happen. He's a liar and the father of lies. Encourage yourself. Remember who God is. Remember the integrity of the one who has promised. And keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep applying your faith. Keep confessing the promises. Keep claiming the promises. And the almighty God will not fail you. He will answer you 
according to his will in the name of the Lord Jesus. The last and the fifth D I wanted to talk about this morning that can hinder you from receiving God's promises is the devil. The devil does not want anyone to receive God's promises. He's busy going around people telling them how unfaithful God is, how he will not do what he has said, how he's no longer answering prayers. In the last one year, I cannot count how many people, how many people have asked me the question, does God still answer prayers? Because the devil is at work. The Bible says that what he does is to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants all to believe that God is not faithful. He wants all to believe that God does not want us to have a good life. He sows seeds of doubt. He sows seeds of disappointment. He sows seeds of discouragement. He even causes delay. All the four Ds I mentioned earlier can actually be the work of the devil. We see delay in Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. When Daniel had prayed, the Bible says, Then said he to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before God, your words were heard, and I am come for your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. The devil caused the delay. Daniel prayed. God answered. And then the devil and his cohorts rose up in the prince of the kingdom of Persia and withheld the answer to that prayer for 120 days delay. So the devil can be the one causing the delay directly. He can bring doubt. He went to Eve in the garden of Eden. And he said to him, has God said? In order for it, Eve to doubt, he said, has God said what was his business? Whether God said or he didn't say, what was his concern? Did God say it to him? But he went and planted seeds of doubt in Eve and said, has God said? And it eventually culminated into sin. In um, Numbers chapter 14, verse 1 and 2, we see both disappointment and discouragement manifesting. The Bible says, they cried all night. And then something struck me <coughs> in the Living Bible translation. He said, we wish we had died in Egypt. What is that? That statement is the work of the devil. Then it says again in verse three in the Living Bible, it says, rather than being taken to this country ahead of us, what they are referring to is the promise of God. Rather than going into the promise of God, what did they say? They said, Jehovah will kill us there. Go and read the Living Bible. That's what they said. They said, Jehovah will kill us there and our wives and our little ones will become slaves. That's the work of the devil, twisting things in the mind of the people. There are, these are seeds that the devil sows in the minds of people. And so it brings delay, it brings doubt, it brings disappointment, it brings discouragement. And all these hinder people from receiving the promise of God in their lives. He that must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
I looked at that scripture this weekend a few times. What was I looking for? I was looking for where it says, he that must come to God must believe that he is, but it does not fulfill promises. And I looked and looked and I changed my glasses and I didn't see it. Because that's not what he said. He's a rewarder of those that seek him. What does that mean? When you pray, he answers. When you serve, he blesses, he blesses, he rewards. When you belong to him, he takes care of you. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So how do we receive God's promises quickly? Number one, build your stamina in the word of God. Prayerfully study the word, meditate on it, speak the word, practice the word, live the word. The word of God is the treasury of every one of God's promises. It also reveals Christ to us, who is the embodiment of each of the promises. So we must deeply mine, we must mine the soil of God's words to discover the gems. And so pay attention to God's word. Unless you study the word of God and you know the word of God and the word of God dwells in you, doubt will spread like cancer in our hearts and we will lose sight of God's promises. Number two, wait patiently. Hebrews chapter six, verse 16 says of Abraham, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And so for you to obtain the promise, wait patiently like Abraham did. Perhaps right now you are thinking, hey, I did not form the promise. I claimed the one straight out of the Bible. Yes, it didn't come true. Why does God keep his promises for me? Why doesn't God keep his promises for me as he did for the heroes of scripture? Let me draw your attention to something. Remember how the Lord fulfilled his promises for the biblical heroes. Abraham waited 25 years until he was 100 years before God's original promise of the birth of Isaac was fulfilled. How long have you waited? Pardon? Look at David. God promised him that he will be the next king of Israel. But he had to wait years under a king that was out to kill him. And through it all, he learned patience. But then God fulfilled the promise. Even as early as the book of Genesis, the Lord promised his Messiah to his people. But it took millennia for Christ to come in the fullness of God's timing. Wait patiently. Number three, obedience to God's will. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 teaches that obedience is a key to obtaining God's promise. It says you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. What did the scripture say? When you have done the will of God, you will receive what he promised. You are living the life you want. You are willingly disobeying the Bible. You are willingly disobeying the word of God. You have applied sense to the word of God. As far as you are concerned, it does not make sense. As long as you are, con as you are concerned, God cannot be asking you for that. As far as you are concerned, like some people say, it is Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us. So it will be too much for God to ask me to obey this. It is archaic. It is ancient. And then the same people say God is not fulfilling his promise. Why is he not fulfilling his promise? Because his word says you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Persevere, obey God's word to the latter. The Bible says when we disobey one, we have disobeyed all. So obey. Number four, because of my time, faith. 
Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says that the Old Testament heroes by faith obtained the promises. When God promised Abraham a son, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew in faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 20 says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. In your circumstance, don't waver. Are you strong in faith? If you are not, ask God. Give glory to God in that circumstance, and you will see the manifestation of God's promise. Caleb said in Numbers 13, 30, he said, let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Did he see what the other 10 spies saw? Yes, he did. He saw what the other 10 spies saw, yet he said, this is not by sight. I saw the sons of Anak. It's not by sight. It is simply because God promised and he never fails, he never lies. He never breaks his promises or his covenants with us. Let's go up at once. If he parted the Red Sea, he will give us victory in this battle. We do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Do you dwell on the negatives? If you dwell on the negatives, or you surround yourself with people that are saying it is impossible, negative people, then you will lose sight of those promises. This morning, I encourage you to do what Paul says. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 to, to 9, instead of dwelling on the negatives, he says, finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, Whatever is lovely and brings peace. Whatever is admirable. Whatever is of a good repute. If there is an excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your hearts. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in your daily life. And the God who is the source of peace and well-being will be with you. What is he saying? Discard the negatives. Think on true things, honorable things, right things, pure and wholesome things, things that bring peace, things that bring good reputation, things that bring excellence, things that are worthy of praise. Don't be mourning about what has not happened. There are so many things in your life that has happened. Lastly, how do I receive God's promises? Learn to rebuke the enemy. Learn to rebuke the enemy. We are children of God, joined hands with Christ. We have not been given the spirit of fear that we may, that we may begin to fear. But we have been given the spirit of adoption that we might cry, Abba, Father. You cannot fear the enemy. Learn to rebuke the enemy and his works while holding on and staying focused on his premises and on his promises. The devil's attack strategy is to weaken you, to make you to give up, to make you to doubt, to make you to feel disappointment, to make you to feel discouragement, so that you can give up and surrender. You will never emerge a victor or possess any promise if you do not hold your ground and keep standing. Learn to rebuke the enemy and his works and stand. You must rebuke the spirit of delay. Rebuke doubts, rebuke disappointments, rebuke dis discouragements in Jesus' name. Don't toy with them. They are the toys of the enemy, not yours. Don't let your guard down because Satan will capitalize on it. There is a path to God's promises and it involves the cross, but it is a path of victory. Stand your ground. And when it involves the enemy, do spiritual warfare to possess your promise. Fight for the promise of God in your life. Fight for the manifestation of the promise of God. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. This is what the Bible says. Take a stand against the devil. Take a stand against the work of the devil. Take a stand against the devil working against you. Rebuke them. Charge them to get behind you. Raise up and keep moving until you obtain the promise. You will obtain it in the name of Jesus. In conclusion this morning, what is the promise that you need to claim? Is it healing? 
1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes you were healed. You see, wisdom. James 1.5 says, if you lack wisdom, ask him. He gives generously. Are you a victim of slander, of whatever? The Bible says he will perfect it. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you and he will establish you. You need a way to open. The Bible says is the way maker. He makes ways in the wilderness. That is a promise. You need a new beginning. He can give you a new beginning. You need your sins forgiven. He says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive you your sins and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God promises God's promises motivates us to grow. It motivates us to move forward in spite of any obstacle. When you don't lose focus, when you continue to hold on it, when you are standing, it is not surprising, therefore, that Satan seeks to keep us from embracing the promises of God. Don't let delay, doubt, disappointment, discouragement, or even the devil keep you from holding fast to God's promises. Hold on tightly to it because the God that you serve is faithful and it will, fall, it will, it will fulfill it in the name of Jesus. This morning, I would like to speak to someone. Maybe you don't even know this God that is making the promises. It is never too late. Right now, it is not too late. Until Jesus comes, it is not too late. Today, you can know him. One of his promises is that if you confess his, your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Your sin can be forgiven. You can be cleansed from every unrighteousness. The Bible makes us to understand that everyone has sinned. No one is righteous, not even one person. And the Bible says that the payment, the consequence, the price of sin is death. But we thank God that he sent his son, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God has showed us his great love by sending the Lord Jesus Christ to take our place and die the death that we should have died has sinned us. And all we need to do to have our sins forgiven, to receive the salvation, to receive eternal life is to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 to verse 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This morning, would you like to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? This morning, would you like to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? I invite you to do this. And if you want to, I would like to pray with you. First of all, take a few minutes and say, Lord, I am sorry. Indeed, I have done wrong. Indeed, I have been sinful. Indeed, this is what I have done and that is what I have done. This morning, I have been told that if I confess my sins, I'll be forgiven. And so I confess my sins before you and I ask for your forgiveness in the name of Jesus. If you ask God for forgiveness a moment ago, please say this prayer humbly after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness today. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn away from my sins this morning and I invite you to come into my heart and into my life. I will trust and follow you for the rest of my life. This very moment, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my own personal savior and my Lord, my Lord, come and take control of my life from now on. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. If you said this prayer, I congratulate you this morning. You have just made the best decision of your life. You have just laid a foundation upon which every other person, every other thing in your life will stand. You have just crossed camp from the camp of the devil to the camp of God. I pray for you this morning. Please look at the item, the, um, your screen, and write down the contact, either the email address or the phone number 
make contact with us this morning. If you are not quick enough, go to our website, type on Google, Grace Chapel Chesterfield. When you get there, click on contact us and send us a message so that we continue to pray for you. God bless you.